Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Silicon Valley Product Management Association. Uh, thanks, thanks for coming. You have a, a pretty good program today, um, or this evening, I should say. Hopefully, uh, it uh, is of use to all of you. I uh, hope that you take the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, we, we hope that this uh, can be as interactive as possible, and then that way you get to, to maximize the amount uh, uh, of value that you get out of that. First announcement that I have, you all have postcards on your tables and I'm assigning homework. Uh, take that home, stick it on your fridge, stick it above your office uh, coffee machine, spread the word. How many of you have been to product camp before? Okay, so how many have not? All right, you should ask when they're done what product camp uh, would like. Uh, Product Camp is a, an unconference. Uh, this year it's being held March 21st at Santa Clara University. Uh, it is for product managers, product marketers, product designers, entrepreneurs, uh, basically anybody whose job involves product. Uh, it is the, the theory of an unconference. We do not have a set agenda. Um, people come as uh, participants not just attendees. So if you have a great idea or a uh, interesting technique you've come up or, or lessons learned the hard way that you'd like to share with your fellow product uh, professionals, uh, you can fill out a, uh, a sheet when you arrive and put your idea on the wall. Uh, when you arrive, you're given three uh, dots and these are for voting. So there's a giant wall when you walk in and you can see all the ideas on the wall. People vote with the dots. They can put all three on something that's off the chart amazing. Uh, they can put two and one or one, one, and one. Uh, at the end of the keynote, we usually have an amazing speaker. Uh, we've had uh, people from the, uh, the chasm group, if you've ever heard the, the term crossing the chasm. We uh, have had folks from, from NASA, uh, from all sorts of other amazing speakers come for the keynote. Uh, and then at the end of the keynote, we generate a schedule, and uh, uh, from there, the, uh, it gets interesting. We have uh, a lot of expertise in this valley. We don't, as product managers and product professionals, spend enough time talking to each other. Um, this is our opportunity to really get out there and network with our, our fellow uh, product professionals and learn uh, you know, best in practice and really exchange ideas. It's a, it's a dynamic event. It's really exciting. It does not interfere with your work day, hopefully, because it's on a Saturday. Um, but we take over an entire building, uh, and we have breakout sessions. And so uh, please come. Uh, if you're interested, we do uh, the sign-up sheet for um, uh, the mailing list is live on the website, Product Camp Silicon Valley. Um, and please volunteer, please please uh, check it out. There are also videos of all the presentations, so um, this is your chance to be famous if you want to present in front of, in front of uh, next year's website. Um, but it's also a great resource to go back in and look at the archive and see what amazing presentations have been given by some of our leading experts in the valley. Um, so a couple of additional things, because we're always looking to improve ourselves as, as product managers. Uh, these are a couple of recommendations from, from Brendan and a couple from myself. Uh, how many of you have uh, Disney Plus streaming? Okay, a couple. Probably people with kids primarily. Uh, there is a series they have called The Imagineering Story. Uh, it is really interesting to see how they go through the design process, how they test that with customers, with their audience, as it were, and, and just the whole process of, of how they create a particular end-to-end uh, -end experience from, from the Disney perspective. Uh, I don't think many people would argue that Disney is, uh, they're pretty spectacular when it comes to coming up with an entire all-encompassing uh, guest experience that, that uh, they're almost unmatched in that field. Uh, so that's it's definitely an inter interesting peek behind the scenes. There's also another series uh, on Netflix, well, again, if you're on a streaming service, called uh, The Art of Design Abstract. Uh, 
also rather interesting look at behind the scenes of, of design and some of the pieces behind that um, and the folks involved and what they go through. Um, how many of you have heard uh, how I built this? This is great. This is it's phenomenal. a phenomenal. You can you can. It's available as a as a podcast for all, all sorts of different podcast series. It is played on uh, KQED radio on some evenings, but I haven't yet figured out. What it's Sunday is. Sunday nights at seven thirty. Sunday nights at seven thirty. Uh, they had a phenomenal presentation on the guys who came up with the method dishwasher soap or the hand soap. You've probably seen their kind of fancy looking bottles. Uh, and what it took to get off the ground. Uh, it was an amazing story with uh, you know somebody in their apartment and they were ordering uh, different chemicals and they had them stored under their bed in their apartment and they were trying to figure out what's the right bottle and how do I get it into a store and uh, it, it, it was quite the journey and a lot of the other uh, uh, talks are about diverse different businesses and products and how they got started and it's, it's pretty, pretty uh, highly recommended basically. Um, if anyone is interested, there is a product management and networking happy hour uh, coming up and hosted by Apple Computer, February 11th. Uh, it is not in the Magic Spaceship, but it is uh, in, the, in the neighborhood. Uh, but if anybody's interested, uh, it is an opportunity to meet and talk to some of the folks. Uh, they are uh, obviously uh, recruiting, but it's also good networking in general. Uh, you can ask them some interesting questions like um, how do you do customer research when you refuse to when your products are secret? Uh, you know, that would be a fantastic question I think, to, to lob their direction. How do you keep your sales up when you shut down China? There's another great question. See, there's there's you know this this could be highly entertaining if the right people show up. So uh, uh, that's uh, quite good. We also have uh, if you missed last month's meeting. Uh, it is available on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel, uh, SVPMA. Uh, it was a phenomenal presentation, very interesting, uh, in a market that most of us have no experience in uh, surgical robots and that entire world. It was fascinating to see different product management techniques brought to bear on an alien landscape of, of, of marketplace. Uh, so that was, that was fascinating and, and quite riveting. Uh, we also had uh, have online the video from the seven minutes that uh, Stymie PM Impact. Uh, that's also one of the videos available. And just a couple of additional notes. Some of you may have seen the uh, easel at the front. Uh, so as a good product manager, we're trying to share our roadmap with you. Uh, we have a number of, uh, of things on the horizon. Uh, next month we have Ron Blakey coming uh, and he's talking about getting your development team to love you. Um, he spent uh, most of his career in, in software and, and uh, managing large software teams and projects. Um, has a lot of insight uh, as to the relationship between product management and the development teams. Uh, then we have Product Camp on March the 21st. Uh, and then after that we have uh, uh, Alan Wortman from Amazon Lab 126, who's giving a talk on relationship between product management and marketing, and product marketing. So you can see uh, the, the uh, triangle diagram that was on the wall, you know, different major stakeholders that product managers have to deal with. We're covering two out of the three uh, in the next two months. So that should be helpful in just kind of strategizing how, how, uh, how you operate on that. How many of you have been to the new website? Hopefully a bunch. Uh, we have uh, the new website is live. We are rolling out new features. This is a list of the features that are, are coming. Among them uh, is a product management bookshelf. So reading list. So if you're looking for, you know, what's the go-to book on something? And some of us are. We we have the privilege of a couple of authors in our group. Um, we are going to uh, make the reading list, recommended reading list available, and then if you have recommended books, you can send them to us and we can put them up there with, uh, with our recommendations. Um, we're looking at a bunch of other improvements. One of the things we're working on is we almost have 20 years of archives uh, on different topics. 
I am in the process of going through all the content and tagging it. We can use a couple of volunteers if anyone is available and is somewhat familiar with WordPress, or we can train people up from there. Um, but uh, yeah, that would that would help speed up some of these projects. But you will see a, a whole slew of improvements to the website over the next uh, over the next year. We're really doing a, a lot of build pull. And then uh, uh, lastly, we have. Of course, our, our meetup group, our LinkedIn group, face, Facebook, we're on Twitter, uh, the website itself, so stay in touch. And I forgot one small item, Mila had a, a quick event. And one more event that I forgot to put a slide up there before. Uh, I'm Mila Clark, and those of you who've come to a lot of meetings know me. I'm also on the board with these terrific guys. Uh, my colleague and I, Teresa Lyon Stevens, and I are giving our workshop pitching and presenting up in San Francisco on March 19th, Thursday, March 19th, 9.30 to 4.30, 9.30 to 3.30, we'll be at 3 Embarcadero Center, and our job, you're going to have, this is fun, very in, engaging, hands-on, and it's our whole focus is how do you communicate all this wonderful stuff that you've been seeing up here on the slides so that you really do have an impact with that and you get people's hearts and minds with you as well as the information. So 9, 8, 9.30 to 3.30, March 19th. And the easiest way I can give you a link just standing here is if you would want to go to my LinkedIn page, which is just Mela. Clark, M-A-Y-L-A, -A, Clark, just, it's right at the top of my feed under posts, and click on the link and it takes you directly to Eventbrite. Is there a description there, Milo, of the course? There, it takes you to the longer description. Oh, okay. Everything, including bring a water bottle, because we're gonna have you so engaged and so involved that you'll need to have water every so often. <laughs> we provide lunch, though. So with that, I uh, wanted to uh, kind of kick off our, uh, our panel. Uh, we want to take uh, questions from the audience as much as possible. The one thing in order to keep us from bouncing back and forth or um, uh, giving us the ability to cover all the bases, I, we've divided up the questions into kind of sections. Um, so uh, we will start with introductions. Now that you can hear me, we'll start with introductions, uh, and then we're going to split into about five different sections. Uh, we're going to start with questions around customers, um, discovery, customer research, marketing, sales, uh, essentially all of the things and problems that we've run into in how do we get to know our customer and our market and, and, and all of the ball of wax that, that uh, results from that. Um, second, we're going to cover topics around product. So, you know, how do you measure performance? Uh, what sort of metrics do you have? What's the roadmap, future backlogs, uh, productivity, um, any, anything kind of in that space. It, the things that we struggle with as we develop in product. Uh, lastly, we're gonna head more into execution. So uh, organizational issues, team management, politics, uh, you know, managing the product management team, uh, the, the marketing team, the R&D team, all of the organizational dynamics, uh, and then um, the rest of the organization as well. And then lastly, we'll finish up with questions on career and skill sets and uh, making transitions in a career and how to get into PM or shift from one side of PM to another, uh, or how do you hire for your team. Uh, and so that's kind of the, the flow that will go. So if you have a question, say on career, which is our last section, if you could hold off uh, while we're covering the customer questions, and then we'll just kind of keep all the questions together. Uh, and then uh, it's likely that you'll wind up with a, you know, somebody will ask a question. Oh, that's a great one. I've got a, a follow on to that. So that will help to kind of maintain the flow here. With that, uh, I'm going to bring Mayla up here. And she will introduce the panel. She's our moderator. These guys in order. <laughs> We will start. I will do 
least this one since you all are there, with some introductions from me. This is really a wonderful role for me because we're usually all asking each other questions and working together on the board, but this is one time I get to put them on the spot and ask, or at least ask you, your questions or the ones that we have prepared. So I really kind of like this. Um, <laughs> let me begin. Well, we've got some, let me say this for our five categories. We've got some timings on this. We'd like it to be quite flexible. And if we're really into a topic, great. If, if we need to move on though, so that we don't shortchange a later one that everyone is interested in, I don't, I don't actually have a whistle here, but I, I'll keep track of time because we've got some really good stuff. These are all such valuable topics, and I just want to be sure we don't short change any of them. So here is our panel tonight. You know Tom Delhaney, who just introduced our evening, and he is our new president. I don't know if you all know that, and he is doing a super job with this, and not. I am sort of working with um, De Debashish Nayogi, who is in charge of these monthly programs and has found some fabulous speakers for us. And I'm sure you've all met Dan Gallatin, who is also on the board. And I'll ask each of them to say just a couple of words about themselves. For, but first, uh, welcome to those of you who are here for the first time. We are very glad to have you. When, you, when we get into questions, I think you will notice that we are not a shy group. <laughs> and so please feel free to jump in with everybody else because there are always just lots of terrific ideas back and forth in here. And we welcome you to SVPMA. So Tom, why don't we start with you with a little bit about your background, what got you into product management, what you like about it, and we won't ask you what you don't, don't like about it until later on. So um, I got into, I, I spent 14 years in IT and operations, uh, moved from there into technical marketing. Uh, I've worked in a number of different industries, starting with semiconductors, and then software, and then telecommunications, um, uh, eventually landing in cybersecurity, uh, where I spent the bulk of uh, the bulk of my time. Uh, in the last major transition, I went from technical ma uh, technical marketing into product management. Uh, and I had a couple of surprises along the way, which I'll save for when we start talking about product career transitions. And so if there are any, any questions that would be particularly relevant for any of the three panel members, feel free to aim it right at them. Otherwise, we'll just let each person answer as, a, as it seems fit at the time. All right, Devashish? Hi, my name is Devashish Niyogi. Um, I started out in academic research. Uh, I got a PhD in computer science, so I started out in academic research working on AI and machine learning before it became fashionable. <laughs> and uh, then moved into the software industry and uh, doing uh, development and being a development manager. And at that time, I remember talking to product managers and going, you know, that sounds like a much more interesting thing that they're doing than what I'm doing. And so I got the opportunity, I was a software architect in a company that was developing uh, software in the life sciences industry. And uh, after about a year there, they asked me if I would want to take over product management for a particular product that they had, that a fledgling product, and of course I said yes. And that was in 2004, and I've been in product management in various roles since then. And uh, so most of my experience has been in product management for the life sciences industry. And uh, what do I love about it? Um, I love being able to define a product. I like being able to work with people all across the company and I like being able to collaborate. I think one of the joys of being a product manager is the opportunity to collaborate across different divisions and different uh, groups within the company and actually have something constructive and fruitful come out of those collaborations. Dan? Yes, my name is Dan Gallatin. Um, uh, first of all, I, it's like the swinger. Um, 
reason I'm expressing tonight are my own and not my employers. <laughs> Always important to say when you're working for a company, uh, this is a very good company. Uh, oh, and by the way, despite the, uh, the title of tonight's presentation, I'm not a member of the American Medical Association. Um, <laughs> I, uh, the, the first several years of my career uh, were in a technical role. I started off as a software engineer. Um, and then a, a few, uh, several years actually, uh, into today, um, I felt that I was you know, doing a pretty good job, but I wanted a higher level of responsibility. And I, I felt like I was starting to become a little bit more interested in um, strategy and figuring out makes what makes a product successful in the marketplace and I wasn't necessarily in trying to become say an engineering manager um, and, and uh, continue to, to be very focused on implementation uh, so it just so happened that um, at the company I was working at which is a which was a BI company called actually it's now St. Austin's acquired by open text um, there was the opportunity to make a, uh, a trans lateral transition into product management back kind of managing uh, the successor product to the one that I had architected and developed. So I was familiar with the problem space uh, to a certain extent and you know, was reasonably well acquainted with the customers that we had and I decided to take that on just a, uh, on a trial basis. And uh, it turned out to be uh, pretty satisfying uh, for myself and for the people I was working with and so I continued in that role and, and um, I've been in product management now the bulk of my career, and, and uh, mostly in uh, enterprise and SaaS software, um, and that's kind of continuing today um, with a focus on the, shall we say, the, the data products domain within financial services at, at, uh, at Visa. Um, what I like about product management, I think, uh, Echoing some of what uh, Tom and Dennis just talked about, um, I like the opportunity to kind of be at the nexus of um, uh, much of the interesting decisions that take place within the company and to be able to collaborate with a large and varied group of people. I think overall, uh, the day to day work as well is, uh, is extremely varied. Um, I don't feel like I'm ever really stuck in uh, a monotonous, repetitive um, uh, set of, of work, but uh, you know, I get to, to mix, depending on what's important to uh, accomplish on a day-to-day -day basis, I get to mix things up, and yet have continue to uh, have my finger on the pulse of the product strategy. try to take these in order, we will take them in order, and put a bit of a time frame around each one, as I mentioned. Let me get over here so I can see. Uh, heading into customers' discovery, customer research, marketing and sales, when Tom says it's not, not, not just day-to-day -day marketing, there's always something new. Anytime you're doing any customer research or market research, that certainly has to bring a lot of unknowns, but of course, that whole discovery piece is critical to, to the product. Let me open it up to you to see if there are some questions you have. We've got a few of our own, but you may have some too, so. What? Let you might want to use this, although. Hi, hi, hi John Devash, Houston, Dan. Uh, thanks for, by the way, for uh, you know, having this panel and giving us the opportunity, so thank you so much. Uh, question number one regarding customers. Uh, many of us, when we started, I mean, I started product management decades ago, and uh, during those times, there was never a formal, you know, a lot of us did not have formal training on product management. I, I think all of us came from different areas. Uh, the question is uh, uh, during those times, if I recall, I mean, 20 whatever plus years back, uh, Product management, doing the customer research, customer discovery, used to depend a lot of, lot on the domain knowledge, domain expertise, and and used to get people into product management quite a bit based on the domain knowledge. 
and in this day and age, because now product management is very much a well-established discipline. We've got more education, other things are available, which was not there 20, 30 years back. So how do you think is in, in right now, somebody well, going a little bit into career area also, but what are the skills required for doing a lot of that? You know, how things have changed in terms of doing customer discovery, research, or, or you know, and, and how to market and sales to the customer? I can I can take the, the first swipe at that. The most obvious that's that's happened is uh, since so many products have intelligence built into them, they're connected. Uh, mo a huge chunk of us in the valley are spending time building products that are attached to the internet and they are um, uh, SaaS based and they're, they've got other things. But uh, the largest things that we've done is we've instrumented these contraptions. Uh, if you look at the amount of data coming off of a Tesla car, for instance, it used to be the only data coming was uh, they would check the old carbons at the uh, dealership to find out when the last oil change was. Uh, now they get real-time data feeds from, from all the vehicles out there. Uh, that sort of access to customer data and how they're using the product is brand new. And it's flooding us with a lot of interesting techniques because now we've got all this data, but what do we do with it? Um, that's quite different than um, uh, the early days where we had focus groups and we brought sample customers into the room. We had to balance out between different genders and, the, and um, different uh, demographics to make sure everyone was represented and, and balance these panels and, and ask questions. Um, I don't think that's been completely displaced but it's been supplemented significantly where um, we're looking at artificial intelligence and other ways of processing this massive amount of customer data um, because the, the products themselves are, are trying to tell us how they're being used. Uh, so that's, as I say, the largest shift and eventually this AI processing of every button you press, every time you're looking at your screen, every time you're logging in, all of that is being logged somewhere and that leaves some open questions around privacy and some other things, but uh, all of that data is, is typically available to the product team. So that you can use that for hopefully to improve the product. Uh, and and you, you have a lot more insight into your entire customer base, which probably doesn't completely replace some of the face-to-face -face interaction to be able to find out why are you hitting this button or why are you doing this, that's the part that's missing. Yeah, so uh, a large part of it, as Tom said, has to do with SaaS products, where you know uh, it was much more difficult to get customer metrics from on-prem products, which was the norm uh, not so long ago. And now we can actually uh, get usage metrics from any SaaS product at any time. And that's tremendously helpful, and that, that's one of the things that have changed. Uh, at the same time, though, as Sean said, uh, there really is no substitute for being able to talk to the customer directly and find out what they're doing and actually sit down with them and not, not just ask them what they're doing, but see what they're doing. Because often, oftentimes a customer, will, if they want to describe how they're using a system, is different from how they actually use the system. So you have a question over here, but you might want to add something to that. Yeah, I, I think I think I would I would concur that I would also add that there have been innovations, um, you know, in, in the last several years. I think around some of the offline processes that we use for um, uh, for for customer research and user research. Uh, for example, um, I think from what I've observed. We've been able to become more rigorous about user journey mapping. Um, so, so ensuring that uh, we are thinking about the entire customer journey, not necessarily only where they click and what features they use most, but how that relates to the, cust the user's success in terms of their, what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, and especially in the case of, of um, consumer-facing products, how that makes them feel. Um, and, and you're going to have a, a, 
an overall uh, impression of the type of journey that, you're, that is possible to uh, provide to the user. Um, and it's, you know, it's not going to kind of be a monotonic set of uh, delighters or, or areas of satisfaction, but um, you know, it, it is going to ebb and flow based on um, the, what the user is trying to accomplish, what they're experiencing at any given point in time. And I think the, uh, the research methodology around that is something that's been um, growing and evolving over this period as well. We have another question, and I don't know if it follows exactly on that, but take it away. Thank you. My name is Sandeep Bota. Uh, I'm, I'm a product manager at Whitehead Security, and I've been uh, with SVPMA for this is my fourth month. Right? Kind of new. You're an old hand. Um, so my question is actually a dichotomy. Um, Steve Jobs famously quoted Henry Ford saying, if I ask the people what they want, uh, they would say faster horses. So on one hand, uh, you have Steve Jobs telling his Hollywood intuition, you don't have to ask people what they want because most people don't know what they want. And on the other hand, you have uh, all these wonderful frameworks which <coughs> encourage you to talk to more customers, validate every little idea that you have before you go and implement it. So where do you draw the line? And how do you decide if something is worth implementing what pursuing uh, before you validate it sufficiently. Okay. Thank you. Very interesting. We start from the other direction or yeah. that, yeah. Uh, work does that hit one of you sure. more than another? Um, so so I think um, uh, what what generally works best is you you need to think about um, the the entire product development life cycle and the amount of learning that you can accomplish without going building a, a fully featured uh, MVP in some cases. Um, uh, so, so you need to consider, I think, uh, what it is you can accomplish uh, with, um, say, uh, an initial business case, uh, with, a, with a proof of concept, prototype um, and um, and understand that there is going to be a certain amount of learning that you can, that you can elicit from that uh, based on um, the user's reaction to that experience um, and you can ask probing questions such as you know down to uh, being a, judging a particular uh, user UX design, say, you can ask, okay, um, what what is it that you what would want to accomplish next? Uh, how do you think you would go about that, given what you're seeing on the screen or on the paper? So one of the things that you look at is, uh, Dan mentioned customer journey. Um, I'll give you an example of a product that recently worked on. It's a content management system in the regulated life sciences industry. And specifically, what's called an electronic trial master file. A trial master file is a document management system that encompasses all documents that are gathered through the lifetime of a clinical trial, which is conducted by biopharma companies. Now, most customers, who want to implement an electronic file master file came from a world where they had massive binders of documents. And that was the world. So what we're trying to do is to bridge the gap from the manual to the electronic. And what is the journey that the customer has to go through in order to get to an electronic version of what they were doing before? And so you have to look at that, uh, the, the customer journey, what is their current experience when there's one person, a clinical associate, who is sitting at their desk and uploading 500 documents into the system every day. What is their experience that uh, 
that they have and how do you make that experience better. Uh, so as you might imagine, I, I had a conversation a few days ago, when you, if it takes you five clicks to upload a document into a system versus three clicks, when you multiply that by 500 documents a day, that makes a huge difference to the life of a person who's doing it every day. And so uh, in terms of uh, figuring out what it is that's the actual problem that's being solved and trying to address that is where the, the, the skill lies. I'm uh, looking at the time and again, want to do justice to all of these. So why don't we take one more question, well, two more questions. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, hi, this is Martha Nashley, and this is my first time here, so thank you so much. Uh, so, in uh, with my experience, uh, uh, there are two types of products. Some of them are, you know, one type is revolutionary type of product, the other one is a revolutionary. So on the evolutionary, you know, you look at the insight or you know um, all these data that you can capture and actually based on what you see from the user, ex you know, what users are experiencing for the next generation, you make all these improvements. But when you're talking about the revolutionary product, that you know, there is no market, there is no time, there is no business case. I mean, these are like very challenging, and then. Um, then you were talking about the, uh, you know, uh, and sometimes you need to really go for it, you know, and um, uh, especially when you're talking about the emerging market or emerging technologies, you know, there are things that generate nothing exists, you know, so you cannot even do for those things. There is no data, so the, uh, you know, for you to be able to actually uh, back you up, you know, and, um, and those are, I think, you know, what, what you were kind of uh, comparing to. So you need to kind of figure out, you know, which side of the, um, you know, what you're trying to do, and then uh, hopefully you'll find some method to pay for your, uh, you know, intuition, basically. That, that's my... Well, but, Thank you yeah, very much. are you innovating or are you incremental? <coughs> yeah, just a quick thing. Uh, the ability to monitor what it is you have and gather all this data is great, but the trouble is it can get you really focused on where you are right now and the little incremental improvements you can make on that when what you may need to be looking at instead is what your competitor's doing, what are your competitors not doing, or nobody's doing for the customer, what are the new opportunities, et cetera. Any comments on what's new in those areas? I, I would say, so two things. One is that's where the value of the face-to-face -face learning why they're doing something with the product. But really the core part of product strategy is looking at opportunities in the market and slicing the market a completely different way than, than the accepted standard that all of the other uh, companies are doing. So if you have a whole bunch of, of, of people in a particular market and they divide it small, medium, and large, and you say, okay, wait a minute, we're not gonna do small, medium, and large, we're gonna go you know, left-handed users and right-handed users, or we're gonna do, take it a completely different angle and have a unique differentiator based on that. That is the core part of outmaneuvering somebody uh, from a strategy perspective, where you can flip, a product manager can really be instrumental in looking at the market from a different dimension, dividing it up, finding an opportunity, asking the right questions and doing the research ahead of time and then being able to target that and pull out value for your market that somebody else isn't tapping. Blue Ocean? Yeah. Good. Off to a good start. How about the next category, which is easy for me to read here, product, performance, productivity, productivity, metrics, and roadmaps. Uh, anything to do with prioritizing features or roadmaps, as I said, top-down feature requests from execs, that's always interesting. Uh, how do you handle technical depth and uh, how do you establish or select metrics or anything else that occurs to you in this category? So how about some of your questions along the lines of product, performance, 
will wear you out. <laughs> so I think uh, in this previous section, we talked about a lot of the data. We talked about you know, doing instrumenting data or talking to customers and doing these things. So uh, I mean, we will have a lot of data and sometimes, you know, uh, as you know, each uh, product manager can have maybe, maybe one out of 10 or one out of 100. Most of the time you are saying no to the things. So what are the most effective ways uh, uh, panelists have been able to do the tough job of prioritization? Because prioritization, because you always have many ideas, many things to do, um, and um, you know, any, any kind of best practices of being able to prioritize and making some tough decisions in terms of what is the right thing or the wrong thing based on value or, or you know, other ways to do things. But I think, still think that in some of the areas, your knowledge of the domain may still be very important, but any, any comments on that? There are frameworks uh, out there that, that can be generally applied, uh, more or less. Um, uh, for example, um, is anyone familiar with, with RICE? score essentially based on uh, uh, reach with their customers uh, that uh, uh, would be improved by the future, the impact, uh, the, uh, the uh, confidence that you have on your estimates, and then uh, divided by uh, the, uh, the, the effort involved in uh, producing a particular, a particular given feature. Um, I think uh, you know you are going in, in adopting whatever whatever prioritization framework you have. Um, it's going to depend on uh, a variety of different stakeholders. And, and the one thing I think that I've learned is that um, you do not you cannot prioritize in, in a vacuum. Um, it, it's it's going to it will depend on. Um, more, you know, to a greater or lesser extent, depending on, on where you work, on um, subject matter experts in your domain, um, but also, you know, pretty fundamentally, uh, no matter where you are, on on the uh, company's business strategy. Um, so, you know, this is this is where the the actual corporate strategy will necessarily feed into the product strategy to inform what the priority, what the prioritization criteria are. Yeah, so as uh, you know, as Dan mentioned, there, there are different models that one can use. Some of the factors that go into it, and uh, Dan just touched on something important, I think. It's very important to make sure that the product strategy aligns with the, with the overall corporate strategy. Because I've seen, I've seen them diverge in ways that are not healthy for the company. And then you have this push and pull of uh, uh, what we're doing in the for the three-year roadmap of the product that actually takes it slowly away from what the rest of the company is trying to do, and so there are there are there's the corporate strategy, there's the overall product strategy that should be aligned. There are uh, demands made by key customers that uh, spring up and. Uh, hey, we just got this huge customer deal and this customer wants features A, B, and C. And can we do it next month? And uh, so things like that can play havoc on your roadmap. And it's a balancing act and uh, I, in my opinion, there's more art to it than uh, people give credit for. Uh, it's, uh, you can model it, but ultimately, you have to make, the, sometimes there are subjective decisions that, that creep into the process of deciding what goes into each feature, uh, goes, what goes into each release, what gets prioritized over other uh, features. Um, uh, do we entertain this customer who's jumping up and down, uh, yelling versus customers who are more patient and can are reasonable about uh, progress 
where we can actually provide them functionality as version one, version two, version three, so that you have a, you know, what I call the uh, MVF, the minimal viable feature, where you can then build upon that feature in subsequent releases and, 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 and provide that to the customer. So there are various metrics that go into, uh, can go into these models, and then you have to look at what comes out and make sometimes just use common sense to make these prioritization decisions. And just a, a quick follow on to that. You're, you're always making trade-offs between multiple stakeholders and you're doing multivariate analysis, mm -hmm. which is messy and, and any model that you come up with is just a, a gross approximation and the priorities that you have this week hopefully don't drastically change week to week, but they do alter. The one thing not to do is to let one stakeholder completely monopolize your entire uh, roadmap. Uh, I know of one organization that uh, the, the VP of sales uh, started inserting into the roadmap on a regular basis, and then it became more and more frequent over time. And it was based on we lost deal X because competitor A had this feature and we did not. And okay. The VP of Engineering and the CTO said, "All right, we'll add that into our, we'll add that into the top of our, our our development list." And then that happened again and again and again and again. And uh, inevitably, what they did not see coming is they slowly pulled into the wake of their largest competitor, and they were following the largest competitor's product development strategy six months behind them. And they had no differentiating features whatsoever because all they were doing was finding out what they were losing and what they didn't have and adding that. And so that's the danger of having a single stakeholder that's got one view into the market, one view into the opportunity, and they're driving completely. It's a role of the product manager to say, okay, well, that's one view, but where's our technical debt? Where's our new customers versus existing customers? And balancing all these different stakeholders into a comprehensive strategy. Great, thanks for uh, answering questions here. On a, uh, my name is Jesse, I'm a product manager. Um, on a follow-up to that is how do, you, how do you effectively fight against that loudest stakeholder? I have, I'm in that position, which many of us are probably in, or will be, hopefully. <laughs> um, and I'm, you know, I've, I think the dark arts uh, is what maybe you were referring to, or you know, sort of, it's more, it's, it's part art, it's part science. There's plenty of tools to, think about how to piece these together. But I was wondering if, if you had any specific, you know, any general recommendations about how to sort of fight those dragons a little bit. Um, I have tried a little bit and succeeded, you know, succeeded a little bit, but also failed. So I'd love to get some. Right, some two quick on. ones and then I'll see what other ideas folks have. The two quick ones I've come up with, uh, one is when, uh, when they were doing win-loss analysis and that became the entire product strategy. Um, getting other stakeholders to realize what they were giving up when a primary stakeholder was getting his way or her way and to say, oh, well, the VP of sales got this, but you know, the head of, uh, of Europe needs these things for compliance and they're not gonna get it because we're giving it to them. And so understanding these scarce resource trade-offs and getting some other stakeholders to help back you up that, hey, you know what, that's gonna take six or nine months um, because we have some other critical items. And so when the other people are dropping off of the schedule, uh, if you can balance some of the stakeholders against each other. The second category I've seen is just collecting some data yeah. to say, look, here's the new market opportunity that's a $1.5 billion market and you're chasing this little $100,000 sales deal um, you know, at some point we need to get into this market because here's what the competition is, here's what it's going to cost us. And so having some data and the more uh, credible the data that you can collect, the better. Um, but that can speak, if you're having trouble getting, getting your way um, and it's, hey, here's this one PM, I'm an I'm a executive vice president, you know, I'm going to throw my weight around. 
you need something else to, to enhance your credibility, and a lot of times it's outside data as well. Besides? <laughs> so, uh, you mentioned uh, customers, and uh, I've had the experience of one very large customer trying to drown out all the other customers, and I think many of us have had that experience. And uh, first of all, it's very important to have buy-in from within your organization so that the people who are talking, you know, the, the VP of product or the chief product officer, they you need to be aligned with them to make sure that your roadmap is not disrupted. And uh, sometimes it's hard because this one customer is dangling future business uh, over your head and uh, saying, unless you give me this feature now, I'm not going to give you any additional business. And, and those are company strat strategic decisions that uh, sometimes have to go up chain. And uh, one of the things that uh, I have done is ma maintained uh, essentially feature request lists from each customer and try to try try to basically merge feature request lists from different customers and and prioritized based on that and said how many customers are affected we're not buying we're not selling one off products anymore we're we're selling a product that will be used by all of our customers right whether they're using a specific feature or not they're using the same product and so um, the communication with the customer at the strategic level say at the VP or higher level is key to this to set the right expectations to the customer and I've had that experience very recently there was uh, one customer that that was essentially doing that dangling feature business uh, you know versus uh, getting features and it it takes time to bring a customer around, especially if they're not being reasonable initially. And uh, uh, it, it took several months to get the customer to realize that we do have a roadmap, we do have a strategy, and that we have to, for the sake of the product and the company, we have to follow it. So that's a discussion that usually happens at the CTO or CPO level. Just a quick comment on your question and yours. So, um, one of the experiences I had is that sometimes if they ask for a feature, you have to go beyond that because you have to understand why they're asking for it, what benefit they're looking for. Right. And there are two things. Sometimes you say, you know what, we, we have already something that can do what you're asking for. Yeah. Or you can say, you know what, you're right, this is necessary. And you, then you go through your negotiation. Can I give a piece of it now? and then the rest of come in six months or whatever period. So that kind of put them on me, I'm paying attention, you're getting love from me, but I also don't mess up my, uh, my roadmap and my other customers. The other thing that it's, uh, uh, I, I've tried it particularly with the salespeople, the guy found with the guy, hey, hey, you know, if I have this feature, I'm going to sell $10 million more. My approach has been great. Uh, okay, so let's document that, you put it to your code, official code of, and would be part of your quota retirement and your commission all would be connected to that. <laughs> Definitely I would do that. Uh, the moment you say then the posture changes it. Well, maybe it's not really that necessary. So sometimes you also want to make sure that they have a stake. It's not the problem, that they, have, they have a stake uh, in the decision. So if the decision is not the right decision, you as a product manager are not the one who lose, right? They also have something, uh, whether it's their commission or, or, or something. Yeah, the sales engineers or solutions engineers can be key into drawing out that, wait, wait, there's another way to, to satisfy this customer need to be stack these features a different way or configure the product differently. On to your comment, I think there's a, another thing that you can use customers just like you can use stakeholders internally to say, oh, okay, you want this? Well, then you don't get that. And, and that sometimes forces them to put that same priority that you forced internally. And so they're making the decision strategically instead of the guy who says, no, I just really want that, but maybe I don't need it. 
and di different customers can be, cust having customer, direct customer uh, contact can be one of your best friends. I've had uh, features before that, you know, were going to come off of a roadmap and I was able to say, <coughs> and say you know, one of the top six banks in the United States wants this feature, but it's just missing this little extra bit that I can, I can fit into the engineering margins almost. Uh, and they were looking at the feature saying, well, no one's using it, so we're gonna kill this and add something else entirely. Um, and so being able to call the example out by name, you know, oh, you know, one of the largest retailers in the United States really is interested in this, you know, and you could, if, you, if you've got that kind of a, a knowledge of the, of the market, you can, you'd be amazed at how much weight that carries. Let's move on. Transformation plan. So, uh, ideas that you shared are actually pretty good. But what I've also often noticed is that one, if these um, dragons that Jesse was talking about, I call them hippos or highest, sure, yeah. highest mm -hmm. paid people, highest people pay for people 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 people. Yeah, yeah. whatever that is. So, if they are hierarchically, politically way above you, I think it's often very difficult to impose that kind of attitude or as well as restrictions. I cannot really go to my chief revenue officer and say, if you can sign this dotted line or put it on a contract or tie it to your bonus because guess what, maybe the next hour I'll be fired. So how do you diplomatically deal with these kind of situations? And how do you still make sure that the business is looking at the larger interest of the product and the business? and not just of that particular deal or that that quarter's goal. When you want to look at a reach of say, hundreds of customers versus one or five or 10 customers that are driving majority of your roadmap. Anybody want to take a quick shot at that? Can I comment on that? Yep. I, I think it sort of came about a little earlier as well, which is typically we say that, hey, if you have a suppose a product council or some sort of multiple stakeholders in the team together and you sort of agree on a certain priority of, of things that you decided to execute, if somebody brings in you know something else that has to be done and we may be the CEO of the company, uh, but say, okay, if I if I do this, I have a zero sum game. I have a you know defined amount of resources. What do you want me to drop? And if you drop this, this is what's going to happen, or why we are doing this. And, and that playing that trick, typically, and if it's a group of people, uh, if people have already agreed to a certain strategy, changing something else, it almost 99% uh, of the time, it works because there is all these other people are, are backing you up, and all the people are trying to tell you, hey, I mean, if I do this, so many sales we are going to do or something else is going to happen or we are not going to meet our strategic goals, business goals, company goals. So all of these different things happen. So basically trade-off, I mean, if you, if you do this, then what do, you, what do you want to give up? As soon as you discuss that, then it falls into place. And if this is the right time, you mentioned other people and that just happens to be our next category <laughs> of team management, <clears throat> like that segue in there. Uh, unless there's a burning uh, question or comment, I'll move into this. And we, we will probably have time for other comments later on. So uh, please hold on to those if you've got something else to say. Team management, uh, some of the issues that we, we have, of course, encountered, and you have too. What methods do you use to ensure productivity, to get things done? How do you align R&D teams? product vision, product strategy, product roadmap, leveraging your SMEs, your uh, subject matter experts, and probably a dozen or so other issues that come under that. So in the category of team management, uh, the whole team approach, cross-functional, as well as, of course, within the teams, uh, what questions would you like to bring up? just on the, on the general front. Uh, there were a few early questions we got in on, you know, how do you balance, because you're not the PhD in technology X, 
you know, how do you how do you speak with authority to an engineering team when you've got a bunch of PhDs on the team and you're, you know, just a product manager and you're coming in? Um, and part of the one of the first lessons I learned in product management, I didn't get into product management. I delayed my transition into that for a number of years because I always thought, well, these guys know a little bit more than I do. Uh, there are so many different topics you need to know. You cannot be the world's largest expert in all the categories of all those frameworks over there. You can see there's a lot of boxes and you can't, you can't be a PhD level in all of those uh, and still work full time. Um, you have to be comfortable that the finance person knows more finance than you do and that the engineering team knows more technology than you do and the business team knows more. Your value is actually connecting the, the dots. Um, and so, you know, I'm completely fine with asking the right questions of the engineering team. Um, obviously, if you ask certain questions certain ways, they roll their eyes. Um, but I have told them, you know, look, I am not asking you for a yes answer to every question. I am here to ask good questions so that if something comes up at some point and uh, management asks, why was this this way? Or why didn't we do something? The, the first answer from engineering isn't, we didn't think of that. So I create good products by asking good questions. You know, what if the customer does this? What if the market shifts this direction? How would the technology respond to this additional requirement? And throwing out those levels of questions and letting the experts map the technology to the problem and then helping to, them to shape experiments. Um, that doesn't require that I know which bit in which packet on which protocol and which software server does something. Um, if I'm down in the weeds at that level, and I, I've had a number of product managers work for me that were down at that level, it meant they were missing some of the key things going on in other parts of the product management layer. They weren't, weren't dialed into the business strategy or they were missing customer face time, they were missing something else. So by being in the middle, let the experts in each one of those other areas be the expert, but work with them with good questions. I, I, I think it's uh, very important to build trust with engineering. It's one of the keys that I've found um, and, and clearly, if uh, you're not as technologically inclined as the people in engineering team, which is, which you probably won't be because that's their job, right? And you trust them to do the, their job. They trust you to do your job. But the key is, the key is to build that rapport where engineering can trust that when they tell you about some technical difficulties that they're having, for example, that is delaying the implementation of a feature, that you at least have a rudimentary understanding of what the issues are. And so you have to get to the level of knowledge where you actually do understand why they're having the problem. You may not understand the exact problem, uh, but you have to understand why they're having the problem and be able to have that communication going so that you're always on the same page. Uh, you don't want to be in a situation where other stakeholders are questioning why certain features didn't get developed the way they should have been and you and engineering are saying different things. That's, that's trouble right there. Uh, you want to be aligned with your R&D group. You want to be in a position of complete trust between the two groups. And as Tom said, you don't have to understand every single technical detail, but you have to understand enough that you're aligned. So I think another question along these lines is how do you how do you get future customer needs that you see pushed down into the R and D team when sometimes it seems like they just want to go develop? <laughs> well, this is this is the key. Thing. Not that that's ever happened. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's always the cool little you know, flight simulator that you <coughs> use to insert into Microsoft Excel. <laughs> but um, that's that. 
that's one of the key things is really bringing that customer view and translating that for the engineering team so they see the value. Um, at the end of the day, when I see different groups or stakeholders that are, are misaligned, uh, the most helpful thing when they start going at one another is to really hit the pause button and talk about why are we all here, who is our customer, why, how are we making our customers' day better and enhancing their lives and, and their whole experience and getting rid of the headaches. And if you really focus on the customer side and, the, and creating the value and driving the business, uh, you know that makes everyone successful. So it may be cool that some one engineer got to brag about something that they inserted in, um, and that's you know there's a whole separate conversation about how to motivate uh, engineering teams. But at the end, if everyone is successful in making the customer happy, then it will grow the company and make everyone be successful. And that's one of the reminders that periodically I find has to occasionally be brought out when they're making a sacrifice that, okay, I can't get this in here. But yes, but guess what? Um, you know, there's this massive customer and they've got this huge headache with you know, offshore oil rigs or whatever whatever market you're in, and, and we're fixing that, this other customer is gonna be delayed by three months in getting their problem fixed, but this is a much bigger problem. And it may not be as, as cool, but um, once they see kind of the customer, most people wanna be helpful. And that's that's the... Uh, that's the where, where I've gotten in trouble is, is where um, there's situations in which um, Everyone on the team wasn't aligned on the fact, on the need to be transparent uh, and surface what the team was going to work on, and subscribe to the notion that product, our our responsibility is ultimately to set the priority, um, and completely divorce that from the notion that only product can come up with ideas to put. Uh, into uh, the, the feature, in, 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 into the product. Um, but it is imperative, I think, that product sets, is ultimately responsible for setting the direction from pulling ideas in from stakeholders, from helping the team manage tech debt when necessary, but ensure that they are spending the correct amount of time in the correct places on that to derive mac, uh, optimal value. It just really spills over into the, the next category, which is organizational dynamics. I'd like to go back for just a second to something you said, Tom. I don't know if you've seen the many frameworks that are up on the wall there, but if you haven't, do take a look before you leave because there's some incredibly valuable tools up there. And take a picture, burn them in your brain, they're really worth paying some attention to. Um, let's. Just a real quick comment. Sure. One thing that I found when trying to focus people away from the shiny object, which is why I call it, uh, you know, they're, they're looking at the shiny object, is saying, is that going to deliver business value? Yeah. It's putting that in, the, in, in trying to keep, keep getting back to whatever we develop needs to have business value. Yeah, that, that's frequently something sure. that needs to be. Um, you get people diverging on development plans when they don't have a clear picture of the customer that they're that we're attempting to help. And that's part of that business value. And, and that's one of the things that having a clear product vision and a clear strategy that everyone has, you know, it's been they bought into it. They see where we're going. We're we're launching the first tablet computer. Or, you know, if you think about the, the hugely successful projects uh, that have been rolled out, there were major engineering challenges. Uh, a lot of those, they spent a lot of time at the beginning of that project making sure everybody understood, here's the customer, here is why this thing's going to be amazing and change the world, and here's who we're helping. And, and once they really, really locked into that, then, then you almost don't have to look at the development work as closely because once they you're sure that they understand who they're who they're developing for and why 
There are a couple of categories on here that I th think right, fit right in there in terms of organizational dynamics. One that is jumping out at me is this historic learning, which I, on my interpretation is, yeah, but we've always done it that way, yeah. and I'm not going to change. And then also moving from technology focused to product focused. I think that's going right along with what we've been talking about. So are there some questions or comments under this uh, more bigger organization? My name is Matsuri. Uh, I'm a technical architect sitting in uh, among a lot of product managers. I don't want to say that I feel like a Kansas City fan in the world. <laughs> but, um, but I have worked with product managers quite a bit and I've worn that hat as well. Where do you draw the line between, uh, you know, when you write requirements for the product? Technical versus product requirements. So well, the question was, how, where do you draw the line between product requirements and technical requirements? Yeah, like who, who does what? Uh, my experience has been that product will normally write feature requirements. And if there are technical features, uh, technical uh, items such as you know, any technical debt, engineering will normally write the designs, create the designs for those. Uh, one example uh, that I can give you is we, in my last job, we were moving our product from a single instance, single tenant architecture to a single instance, multi tenant architecture. Okay, so that work is largely technical. There are not a lot of user facing requirements for moving something from SISTI to SINTI. And so we dedicated almost an entire release uh, and it required six months of work to develop that architecture, the city architecture for that product. And engineering took the lead in defining those requirements and put them into the product. And of course, the product, as, as the product owner, I had a lot of input into uh, setting the direction, but I was not the primary author of those requirements. All my team was not the primary author of those requirements. So it depends on the functionality. If it's a user-facing uh, functionality, then product is responsible. Uh, if it's a technical feature, then engineering is responsible. That's been my experience. And a lot of times it's who, it's who owns or understands the problem the best. Uh, I've been in organizations that did strict division between MRD and PRD and marketing and sales got together and said here's what the customer wants and then it handed over to the, the product management and the engineering team to come up with the, the you know, technical requirement. They had actually MRD, PRD, and TRD, the technical requirements document. So it was very regimented. Uh, nowadays with a lot of agile scrum models you'll have user stories that get submitted from three different groups. You know, the securities guy is writing a, a user story based on, you know, somebody uh, in your form field, instead of answering a number from one to 10, they stuck in the square root of negative 36 and the whole thing blows up. So, you know, okay, we need a patch for that. So that's a, you know, he'll write what the requirement is on that, that you know, you're gonna check the input and make sure that it's in the authorized value. Um, and a test case for that. And that, that can be sitting side by side with something from the salesperson saying, I think that this menu should be blue. Um, you know, <laughs> and they can all coexist. Uh, and then, then it's, uh, you have to make an omelet with all the different uh, ingredients. <laughs> oh yeah, just a quick comment on that. That product management's job is to figure out what needs to be done. The engineering's job is to figure out how to get it done. And the product manager may throw some things at the engineering team that says, we need to have 100 people able to jump on the system and wait no more than five seconds for a response or something like that. Then it's up to the technical fig folks to figure out the architecture that's going to deliver to that end customer. Yeah, and, and the challenge with the technical PM, if you came from engineering 
and now you're a PM, the one thing uh, that may not be helpful is to uh, extend yourself and say, well, I need this piece of code inserted into the engineering teams. Uh, <laughs> this is a temptation and uh, it, it doesn't, you know, let the technical people, you know, yeah, you can do their job, but you have your own job to do. And so you need to be clear on, okay, we're gonna hand this off and respect the engineering team to do the engineering. Similar, I had issues with uh, engineers that went into uh, marketing, as a technical marketing people, mm -hmm. and they spend their time trying to explain, we built this cool thing, let me explain how we wired it up. <laughs> At no point was that conversation about what the customer's problem was and how it was solved. It was all about the engineering journey, not the customer journey. That's cool. So that's another adjustment that you see where somebody has a prior experience, which is very valuable, mm -hmm. but you need to realize, okay, but I'm not doing that job anymore and I don't want two jobs, product management's many jobs already. Which is why speaking of jobs, <laughs> <laughs> our, last, our last set of questions focuses on career management. Funny thing, a couple of issues that Tom put down how, do you, uh, how does the job change from PM to senior PM or a director of product? Uh, what skills can PMs work on for higher impact? Where do you go to attain these skills? And you may have some more of your own. So let's now focus uh, on our fifth category of career. Uh, so I, I'm in a very small product group uh, among scattered product groups around uh, the business. And I find that I probably have a lot more experience with the product part of my job than my manager, who is more of a program manager perhaps, which is fine and good, and I think there's an important aspect to that. But I'm, I'm wondering if you have recommendations about how to help the, the group learn and how, how, because I was looking at this Quan's, one of your charts, the Lidus yeah. charts, and, and I found that some of my skills go far up the chain, but not all of them. And so my goal is to figure out how do I express those skills without stepping on toes and things, but also how do I help the organization grow at large? So I was wondering if you have thoughts on that. So stepping kind of a level up, um, kind of from the director of PM level, when you're running a product team, you've got multiple product managers. I, I frequently find uh, in a well-run team that you've got really diverse levels of which skills are in which individuals. Uh, I've had cases where there was a brilliant PhD technical person who uh, when you said everybody needs to prepare a business case for something and they looked at Excel was really, really uncomfortable, but could do a technical deep dive in virtually, you know, hand them 2,000 pages of technical documentation, they'd read it overnight. Um, and you start to notice, okay, this person's really good with the financial side and it, it was a natural quant. This person is, uh, you know, probably could double uh, as a marketing salesperson and like, amazing graphics and good storytelling skills. And you'll find that people have different levels and across a team, it's great to have people with different skills because they mix together and then if you really get proper teamwork, uh, they can all learn from one another. Uh, and and that that's magic when that happens. Um, what I do find is if you look at your overall team or even the next level of management above you, Find out what skills you have that may be unique from a team perspective. Find out which ones uh, they think they need on the team that they don't have. So yeah, we don't have anybody who knows anything about AI. Great, if you need that and they're not, it's not an immediate need, you can start studying things and within six months when they say, does anybody know anything about this? Um, and that brings up a, a regular thing that I do uh, checking in with LinkedIn about every four months, I pull job recs across the board and see what's being asked for and compare it against what skill sets are on the team. And that just gives an indication of 
possibly what training opportunities there are for the team for individuals. And I recommend that highly. People should do that probably at least a couple of times a year, just on a personal basis. I think for uh, from a team perspective, um, what Tom said, uh, I had in my last position a team of business analysts with diverse skills. Okay, one person was really good at processes and and writing documents. Another person actually came from the professional services organization and was really good with customers and understanding how the product was being used operationally. So you use those skill sets to your advantage for the, for the team. And as Tom said, when you have these diverse skill sets coming together, that really can uh, give you complementary uh, input that completes your team. And to your other, to your question about if you have skills that are at the level higher than your current position, that's an advantage for you to be able to move up the ladder and that you're actually ready for the next step in the ladder. And, and, and I think that you, we should show it. And uh, hopefully we have managers who are not threatened by that, the fact that you know a uh, lot more than what your position uh, would normally, uh, what would normally be part for your position. So that's to your advantage to have that kind of additional knowledge and I think it helps the team as well because it gives you a broader perspective and helps you do your job better. I think we have one more question over here. Yeah. I'm currently exploring new opportunities, um, new challenges. So my question is, <coughs> is it good to be a small fish in a big pond or a big fish in a small pond considering my own, like I consider my own self as a product, I want to manage my own product and my own brand. In the long term, 20 years, 30 years from now, what are some of the advantages of either of these approaches, being a small fish in a big pond or a big fish in a small pond? Thank you. Well, I, I mean, I, I think you, first of all, I would recommend for everyone, anyone who wasn't there, to uh, check out Shreya's Koshi's yeah. uh, um, talk, uh, of which we have a recording on, on our YouTube channel. Um, I, I think it very much depends on what gives you satisfaction in, in what you do. Um, and uh, you know, there's a reason why um, in most interview situations, people ask where you see yourself in 10 years, because they kind of want to understand, um, you know, not only are you, would you, do you appear to be a good fit in the organization as your framework stands, but they want to understand what motivates you as well, uh, you know, what, you know, what gets you out of bed in the morning and, and where you hope to see uh, yourself grow over time. Um, there's no one right answer. And, uh, you know, the one thing I've learned over time is uh, you cannot, let anybody else tell you that answer. They're not gonna. They're not gonna give it to you anyway. I mean, it's, it's something that is intrinsic and something that you need to feel is inherently right for you uh, and, and for for your own personal situation. Whatever other factors are feeding into that. Um, so um, also be open to the possibility that you will the way you feel about, um, say, working at a large company versus a small company is going to change over the course of time as well, depending on your responsibilities in life uh, and, and your interests as they develop. Um, and, and, you know, we're, this is a, a journey that all of us are, are on. Um, you know, it's, it's not a matter of finding one particular niche and staying there. Throughout our career. I highly recommend. Comment, a brief comment. Yeah. 
I highly recommend if it's possible, you know, given that people usually change jobs every few years, that you try out, if it's possible, try out both. I've been in companies with fewer than 100 people. I've also been in a company which had over 20,000 people. And the experience is completely different. And if you have not experienced the other side, you really don't know. Uh, and nothing that somebody else can tell you is actually going to be satisfactory to you. And some people, you know, are more excited about the prospect of working for a giant company with a brand that everybody knows. Wow, you work for this huge company and you had an army of 30 people all doing this one function. Um, like, that's kind of impressive on the one end. On the flip side, it's like, yeah, but you were just doing this one little function. Uh, whereas at a startup, you were in charge of like, what would have been an entire division with, you know, nowhere near the resources, so you got creative and you innovated a lot, you didn't have access to as much of the budget. It's a, it's a different environment and different people thrive in different environments. Some oscillate back and forth, but uh, you have to dip your toe into each and find out what, what's your ideal organization size. All right, thank you all for your good questions. And I, <laughs> I was trying to think how to say this in an unembarrassing way, but you ever gone to a memorial of somebody who's an you know, elderly relative or a neighbor and you learn all these fabulous things about them that you really did not know even though you lived two doors down the street from that person for 30 years or grandpa was in your life for, I don't know, 40. I, and I, <laughs> I couldn't think of any other way to say it except I have known these wonderful people for many years and I am standing here thinking, Wow, I didn't know they knew all of that. But I think something that I really appreciated, and if I was reading all of you correctly, you know, I really valued sharing their thoughts and their ideas, and honestly sharing their experiences and their values. And you contributed the same. So without <clears throat> further ado, <laughs> Why don't we give yourselves and our speakers a big hand?